Welcome to Question Mark, the podcast. Exploring the greatest story ever told with open minds and open hearts. We light it up, we won't come down. And the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights. And the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show. Welcome everybody again to Question Mark the podcast. This is a exploration of the greatest story ever told about the greatest person that ever lived and it's the Gospel of Mark and I've had the pleasure over many weeks now to invite some really interesting guests to talk about various parts of this story, this absolutely amazing story. And today is no exception. I've got my former headmaster, Julian Thould, here today. I'm absolutely blown over that he's decided to uh, help me out here in answering some (laughs) of the questions that come up about this story. Um, Just to say, uh, we're going to have this conversation, really, which you're welcome to join in with, because I'd love to hear your comments and your thoughts, um, either in posts or through other ways of communicating. And don't forget that if you like this podcast, do subscribe um, or or follow it because that way lots of other people will get to hear about it as well. So I hope this really blesses you and encourages you as we look at this passage. Um, Julian, welcome. It's absolutely lovely to see you. That's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And I believe you are talking from sunny Cornwall. Am Am I right in saying that? Um, well, Sonny might be pushing it a bit. <laughs> uh, we just put our youngest son on the train in Campbell this morning, and it was definitely not sunny then, but <laughs> it's getting a bit better. Right. Uh, but we've had some good days recently, and uh, so we uh, took my youngest out to uh, the pub last night for a sort of celebratory meal. He's just turned 25, and uh, we went down to Gwythium, which is on the north coast, if you know the spot of Cornwall, because we're in West Cornwall. So uh, uh, it's... Um, almost as far as you can go west without getting wet and um and the weather is very changeable very unpredictable so sometimes you think it's going to be a good day and, and it isn't <laughs> or the other way around so well, I admire um, your flexibility <laughs> in it's a very pretty part of the world it is a very pretty part of the world i had the pleasure of going down to visit julian fairly recently and it's absolutely beautiful down there julian can you help us and uh, tell us by uh, for for the listeners and the viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and and how you know me. Sure. Uh, Well, I've just returned to my native Cornwall, so I was brought up in Cornwall, a bit further away from where I'm now, just outside Truro, went to Truro School, and then uh, for the sixth form, went away to school, then went on to Oxford to to read history. Um, uh, I never expected to be a a teacher, but uh, I uh, was an archaeologist, actually, originally, and spent a year working in Peru, and uh, to fund a bit of my post-excavation stuff, worked in the local language school and kind of got the teaching bug, which is probably in my genes because my mum was a teacher. Um, my dad was a, a doctor. Uh, and um, so rather fought against it, worked in industry for a while, but in my sort of late twenties, actually felt that this was the right thing. Um, never expected to be ahead, frankly. Now that just sort of happened by accident, really. Um, but uh, I was very fortunate to uh, be the head at King Edwards for 17 and a half years in Southampton. Uh, and uh, Steph was in that school. And uh, uh, so we've worked together for a long time. And, uh, uh, and it was great to see uh, you in particular doing so much for children who um, have very particular needs and uh, something which grew under your leadership and indeed that of Susie, your wife. Um, so that by, I think at the time you retired, um, it was a model of excellence. And uh, it was one of the things that I thought uh, really worked in the school and, uh, and it was a great pleasure to see it grow and flourish. So, Thank yeah, you. so that's, that's me really. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yes, and, and Julian, you retired slightly before I did. Is that, is mm. that, that's right, isn't it? And, and how have you enjoyed retirement since, uh, since that happened? Well, um, I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect of it. I mean, obviously nobody, can do this for you so uh, you sort of it's a bit of a sort of great vacuum really Um, and uh, probably I thought I would 
be sort of very quickly bored. So I'd lined up various trusts to go and work with to sort of keep me busy. But strangely, I think probably actually having time to read, to reflect, to, to do a lot of walking around here, that's been far more valuable. So I'm just quietly stepping back. And one of uh, my former colleagues as a head, um, uh, who was also one of our governors at CARES, uh, he sort of was got to his sort of mid 60s and thought, actually, I, I can't have done this. And so he just retreated into the sort of private, into the domestic sort of arena, if you like. Uh, and I think that's probably what I'm going to do too. Right. Um, but uh, I love the opportunity just to explore things and uh, just to sort of mooch about as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, it's been pretty fun. I, um, one of the things I really miss, I love swimming. So I yeah. finally found a swimming pool uh, that um, is close by and has just reopened after the pandemic. And uh, uh, I do a lot of my thinking when swimming. Great idea, great idea. Whether well, it's in the sea or we, we have a marvellous, um, the largest Lido in England, I believe, wow. uh, down in Penzance, not too far from here. It's 100 metres long and it's an enormous, great sort of art deco white thing, uh, but a marvellous thing to just to swim and think and ponder about the world. Sounds amazing. I, this often happens when you talk about Cornwall. I, I'm just you know, yearning to go back down there again because it, mm. it is very attractive. I'm sure that the viewers and the listeners will be feeling the same. Um, <laughs> but um, today, as you know, our our thoughts should be or are going to be around Mark's gospel and the, the mm. continuing story. I think it would be helpful just before we hear a reading of the uh, to remind remind everyone what the kind of the context is, what the story is so far. Um, and we've, we've got this character, Jesus, who's almost appeared out of nowhere. He's been mm. baptised in Galilee and he seems to have been sent on a mission. He goes to a, a kind of his native town and, um, and he performs a miracle there while he's preaching. And the preaching carries with it uh, this incredible sense of authority. And not only that, the miracle which he performs has that same sense of authority. So there's someone special here um, and the, the, the authority isn't just a sense of human authority there's a divine authority it's almost as if he's doing and saying things in a way that mm. God might or God's representative might and that really um, that really impresses itself on people as they mm. listen to him and um, it's getting to the place where he's getting incredibly popular I can't work out myself whether it's because He's got this ability, obviously, to change people's lives for the better, those who are sick and those who are disturbed in some way or another. He seems to have this ability to, to heal um, and to restore people, um, all sorts of people. I, I can't work out whether his popularity is to do with that, or is it perhaps because of his character, his charisma? There's mm. something perhaps about the way he looks at people, the way he interacts with them, which is completely uh, out of the ordinary. Um, mm. A sense of people being feeling as if they're really loved for who they are, perhaps. Or is it his teaching? I, I, I wonder about his teaching, and then that may come up in our passage as we, as we listen to it. But that's the context so far. Um, shall, we, shall we listen to the passage being read by, mm. by Lucy Warner, uh, my great friend? Um, or if you're watching on YouTube, you will actually see a version of this performed by Stefan Smart, the actor, myself, <laughs> um, who uh, performed it in a play called I Am Mark. So without further ado, let's, let's look or listen to Once that. again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner in Levi's house, there were many tax collectors and sinners eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating 
with tax collectors and sinners. They said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So that's the story. Now, before we kind of look at it, I just want to say something. Maybe it's a bit of a challenge to anyone who's listening to this. For many of you, I guess you've heard this story before but it's not necessarily that easy to understand, even if you've heard it many times. I myself have heard it masses of times, but I'll be honest and I'll say, I've kind of skated over the bits I've not understood. I've kind of assumed I've known what it means, but now as I've performed it and looked at it in a bit more detail, I've begun to realize I hadn't really examined it properly and I've missed out some really important material. So I think this is the whole kind of reason for doing this podcast. It's like this story, which potentially contains with it an, an answer to the mystery of human existence and why we're here and what we're for. It's got such depth and it's easy to read something like this and ignore the depth or just kind of skate over it. So I hope today Julian and I will be able to have a look at maybe just kind of uncovering some of those riches. We'll, we'll see, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we can't promise it. And, and as I say, the whole point of it is to answer questions because there are questions here, mm. implicit in the narrative, I think. Anyway, Julia, let's start with you. Now, how did you feel? What did you think when you first read this in preparation for the, for the podcast? What, what's your kind of overriding impression now? Well, it's interesting because I reread the whole of the uh, Mark Gospel um, in France when I was on holiday um, last month, and just to sort of have a think about it, really. Um, and um, and I think what Mark does, you know, I, I'm pretty confident that a Mark as such doesn't exist. I think it's an anonymous account. We have to probably accept that, but. Um, but it, it has a sort of way of a narrative flow to it, uh, which uh, is, is very powerful, I think. Um, and of course, you don't get in Mark what you get in other Gospels. You don't get anything really about the sort of the childhood of Jesus or anything like that. You kind of launch straight in, really. And it also stops very suddenly. Um, so it's, it's, it's a curious account in that sense. Um, what I, I like about Mark, I guess, is that it's probably as close as you get to uh, trying to sort of uh, unravel the character of this extraordinary man, uh, Jesus, and trying to see the impact that he has, because, you know, this is probably written just before, just after the Jewish revolt in sort of uh, AD 70. And um, it, it's in the light of that sort of very millennial feel, they thought the world was coming to an end. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and uh, this sense of the Christ sort of being there to, to save them from whatever might come forward, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so you get a sort of sense of a, a distillation of how they felt about it, but also you, you have to recognize that you're looking through a glass darkly to quote a phrase <laughs> uh, and you get hints, tantalizing hints, but you also, you, you want to know more, but you, you actually, the answers are there <laughs> yeah. uh, and you just have to accept that uh, doubt is just part of that. You just, yeah. you, you'll never know everything uh, and you can't really get yourself into the heads of, uh, first century Jews, because, uh, you know, I, I think um, uh, I, I'm one of the books I find most influential on this is Gezer Vermis, Vermis's book, um, Jesus the Jew, recognising that, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, a very specific Jewish context when you're, when you're looking at, at, at Jesus. Um, and, of course, by the time you get to Mark, Mark was probably written in Rome. Um, I mean, others suggest Antioch, maybe even Galilee, but probably Rome. It's written in Greek, not Aramaic. So um, already you've got another sort of 
um, another filter, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're, you're struggling very often to work out well, what is going on here. So just like you, you know, I've, I've read this passage and do the gospel many times, but um, I'm still... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, full of, full of sort of questions, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, never really sure that I've got you know, answers yeah, to half yeah. of those. Uh, this particular passage, I mean, yeah. it's significant in the sense that it's sort of you know you're already somewhere into the gospel itself, and uh, you've got some sense of Jesus beginning to come to some sort of maturity as a preacher. Mm-hmm. I think what you can say he was obviously an absolutely remarkable preacher in the way that he could galvanize his listeners Mm -hmm. um could engage with them in a way that perhaps very few can do Mm -hmm. Uh, an extraordinary gift um uh, and somebody who could touch people in the way as a healer which uh, again really made a difference you know life before the nhs such people had enormous value uh and um it's uh fascinating when you can see somebody do that uh, and uh, you know we're very unlikely to meet any like anybody like this ourselves uh, but uh, it's extraordinary when you do see somebody sort of uh, have that uh, capacity to, to to do that um, and uh, I'm interested I'm reading Maggie O'Farrell's book um, on Hamlet it's called Hamlet yeah. uh, and that revolves around um, Shakespeare's wife uh, Anne Hathaway as as a healer right. uh, and with a gift of of the, to, to heal and just how extraordinarily valuable that is and uh, I think the reason you perhaps can see Jesus being so influential apart from anything else is that you're dealing with people in enormous pain enormous desperation mm-hmm. and he offers hope mm-hmm. uh, and some sense of destiny and uh, uh, that is bound to be attractive in any era and there are always going to be people who need that pathway Absolutely. I think I mean I you know, we could spend the whole podcast just talking around some of the things that you've just raised. And I think mm. you've made some really excellent comments. And one of the, the really important things you've just said, I think, is about the Jewish context. I mm. think it's so easy for the modern day reader to read it straight without any sense of filter. And mm. I think that is where we, we can really come up with, with problems, actually um because unless we understand as much as we can what this passage would have meant to its first listeners we're never really Mm. i i believe going to get to the core of it Mm. and i agree with you you know it's it's hard to do that and there are going to be questions that are going to remain no one's ever going to get the answers completely Mm. but i i i have a pet theory um which is based on um something to do with questions and really perhaps the inspiration to this podcast um, there are, I think, 76, no, I'll get, me, I'll get this right, there were 49 questions in Mark's Gospel, which is of interest insofar as I think some of those questions are placed there deliberately by Mark, the author, for mm. us, the listener. Um, so in other words, I think the Gospel is actually intended to provoke questions and to ask questions. Mm. Um, and the reason why I think that's important is because it's not straightforward and it means there's a certain amount of digging that's necessary, a certain amount of thinking and a certain amount of reflection. Mm. Um, the answer isn't necessarily completely beyond us, otherwise there wouldn't necessarily be any reason for writing the story. Mm. I think the story is there to prove a point, but the point isn't clear. Mm. The story invites us to go deeper than we normally would want to with a story to try yeah. and find it, uh, like hidden treasure. Um, so this passage is no exception. It's, it, I honestly believe it historically happened, and, and mm. I'm sure Mark was using eyewitness accounts in, these, mm. in this story, as in many others in this, in this gospel. But nevertheless, within it, there's a message, mm. perhaps, for first century believers, for first century listeners, and also a message I also happen to believe for us too. It's just we have to be careful as we look at it. We don't just kind of transport our 21st century culture into this. Yeah, absolutely. Mistake. I think it's trying to recapture that sense of what it was like actually to be alive then. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I thought about this quite a lot. And I'm, I'm 
assuming that whoever wrote this down, I mean, it's an interesting question. Why did they write it down? Yeah. Um, and I guess by the you know, time, I'm we're assuming around about AD 70, which of course, you know, if you read Josephus, that's when the temple was destroyed and when the great Jewish revolt. And, and that's, you can see that in other sources of the time, it's in Pliny the Younger, it's in Suetonius and so on. So you've got clarity about what took place within whatever you can find out sort of from historical record. Um, but, you know, why did they write down this gospel? What, what was the purpose of doing that? Because they all knew these stories, because yeah. you're clearly dealing with a small group of believers, uh, in this case, almost certainly in Rome. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, why do they have to write it down when they already knew it? Yeah. I, so I, who were I, they writing it for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say I knew the answer to that question, but I would. My guess is, at the moment, how I feel about that mm. is that they are the, this, this account is trying to answer a question, mm. um, the, the big question, which is who is Jesus? Who who mm. who is he actually? And and why why is he? Why did he come? That that is yeah. that is the question. And there's a, whether Mark was writing for people who had various ideas of Jesus or didn't have any idea of Jesus at all. Mm. Um, it's, an, it's a question of identity, I, identity discovery, I think. Mm -hmm. That's at the heart of this story. Yeah. I've also seen it as a way of, I, mean, I think probably by that stage, a lot of those who knew Jesus uh, personally, uh, and I'm sure Mark must, if he hadn't witnessed himself, knew people who had. Um, but a lot of them were probably getting to a point where, you know, life being what it was then, you were jolly lucky to make 50. Um, a lot of them were, were dying and those memories themselves were dying. And yeah. I think probably what they were doing in writing it was to try and capture that. Yeah, well, you're right. The fear of losing it. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they also had this strong sort of sense that the world was very near its end. Yeah. Uh, and that's obviously very much part and parcel of the sort of, the, the sort of whirl and melee of the Jewish world in the first century. Yeah. Um, because Judaism itself was going through an extraordinary sort of period of, uh, sort of flux really yeah. um and you can understand why they were so concerned and then of course they the, the great jewish revolt and the catastrophic consequence um must have meant that for many thought well this is it yeah you know, you know, yeah. Then, you know we we might not see another year yeah. um so and perhaps it was an attempt to try and preserve what they did know about yeah. jesus um well, the if any survived yeah i think that's no, right. I mean, with the Jewish culture, though, it's the Messiah, the, the figure of the Messiah, I think, that's really mm. central there, particularly in the times of crisis that you've described. Yeah. yeah. yeah who is the Messiah? Now, I, mean, I find that very interesting about the, the idea of a Messiah, because clearly for many Jews, the Messiah was, they were looking for another David figure, really, yeah. uh, a sort of military leader. Yeah. Uh, and then along comes Jesus, who's anything but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that must have been really confusing for many yeah. Jews. Okay. Um, and... I, I sometimes wonder how how informed some of the sort of gospel writers were about the sort of Jewish context, because obviously it's written in Greek, so one assumes that this is a Jew writing in Greek, so it's a diaspora Jew, almost yes. certainly. Yeah. Uh, so um, not necessarily somebody who's quite so close to the the world of of Jesus himself, the sort of yeah. world of Galilee and Nazareth and Jerusalem. Um, so. Things like sort of the way they talk about the Pharisees. I mean, I found that absolutely fascinating because yeah. the Pharisees were just a, a slightly sort of less sort of a slightly more humane sort of version of Judaism compared with some of the really sort of strict um, Jews, the Essenes and so on. I don't think anybody would suggest that, say, Jesus was an Essene, yeah. um, but he was probably close to the Pharisees. And this sort of opposition that's set up between Jesus and the Pharisees, I sometimes wonder, you know, was that true? Yeah, um, yeah, no, um, because you know, Jesus in Matthew says very much, you know, I, I'm here to uphold the law. Yeah, you know, that, that's what I'm here for. Um, and so, in that sense, he's quite an orthodox Jew. Yeah. Um, but you've also got this sense of him challenging um, some of the tenets of Judaism, particularly some of the attitudes towards things like the Sabbath. I mean, he's very interesting on the Sabbath in the Gospels because he's saying, well, you know, being a completely sort of uh, if you like a very sort of extreme Orthodox Jew, nothing happens on a Sabbath. 
Well, Jesus is saying, well, actually, on occasions, you can. Yeah. Of course, it's not a position just, that just he took. There were others who were also arguing the same. So you, you can see sort of Judaism going through this extraordinary period of change. Yeah. And Jesus is clearly part of that. Yeah. Uh, and then you get to Mark when somebody's actually trying to say, well, I, I need to capture this yeah. um, before I lose it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I think... Yeah. That's what they were attempting to do. Yeah. And I think also it's worth remembering, you know, when they were writing something down, they were probably writing it once. You know, this is not a blog. Uh, you, you can't just set it out into the ether. Um, somebody else has got to read it. Somebody else has got to copy it again. Yeah. Uh, if you actually look at the way that um, uh, material, you know, there were professional scribe factories in Rome where um, you could get books redone and Cicero yeah. obviously had, done many times to promote himself a bit earlier than this but yeah. but you, you know, no matter how many scribes you had you, you couldn't ha hope to get close to anything that you could do when you've got printing in the sort of late sort of 15th century so it's a, it's a very different world yeah so when yeah. someone's writing down it could almost just be sort of a, a very personal record for a small group of believers in yeah. rome which is probably what it was and were they talking to Paul? Are they talking to others? Who knows? Yeah. Um, uh, it's very difficult to, 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 to see the world from their point of view when they don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, that's interesting. I, well, there's so much there. Again, I think we better actually go to the, the passage itself for a little while mm. and see whether we can unpick some of these things. I, I've had a few thoughts myself, a few um, curiosities, I think would be, it would be fair to say, and a few other things that have come up in discussions with people about this passage. I'm, I'm just gonna throw out a few questions, I guess. Mm. Um, some of them are probably easier to answer <laughs> than others. <laughs> they're, worth, they're all worth asking. Let's see if we can get a few of them covered. Um, so Jesus goes out beside the lake. I mean, that's a question in itself. Mm. It's a, I, I'm just imagining in, in answer to that question, why doesn't he choose a house? Why doesn't he choose a synagogue like he did in the past? He goes mm. to the lake. It seems to be a favourite place for him to go. Is it because it's peaceful? No, probably not. Is it perhaps because that's where the most people can congregate safely? Mm. I guess he's had problems before. He's been in a house and it was so busy in the house that people had to break through the roof to get to him. So that doesn't mm. sound like the ideal venue. So yeah. maybe that's the reason. It's not something I've ever thought of before until we've kind of prepared mm. for this podcast, but it is interesting. Um, I think the choice of venue is actually fascinating because I think what this really shows you is his growing popularity. Yeah. Uh, and having to think, you know, as we would, you know, obviously, you know, we, we both worked in schools for most of our lives and thinking about venues and what's appropriate for a particular audience is something you, you give thought to. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you develop new, new venues because yeah. you need them for a particular purpose. Yeah. Um, and I suggest that probably Jesus was just on that cusp at this point when he was beginning to really motor. Uh, and uh, so uh, he was having to think, actually, how can I do it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, and I guess <laughs> being by a lake means that nobody can yeah. slot behind you you put your audience <laughs> in front of you that's and true. possibly if you can imagine presumably any any lake will have a slope so uh it's almost like a sort of amphitheater in that yeah. sense how fascinating yeah that's really helpful thank you and then he has a lot Not unlike um, Gwinnett Pitt that we visited yes very exactly recently. Gwinnett Pitt <laughs> um, yeah a bit quick quick plug there's going to be a performance <laughs> in Gwinnett Pitt in July next year of Mark's Gospel that's a lovely miners a miners what would we call it um a minus pit, actually, yes, sir. And Wesley, John Wesley, preached there way back in the day. Um, so yeah. Um, so the large crowd congregate, and we've talked about the large crowds already. But what's interesting to me here is he teaches them. I, I, what he doesn't do is perform loads of healing. Mm. And I think this has come up in a previous conversation with one of my guests, Billy, from the last one. I think. No, oh, I heard that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. For Jesus, clearly teaching is the thing. What is he teaching? Probably about, as I understand it, about this new kingdom that God is inaugurating, this mm. new society, this new community, whatever you call it, human beings are being invited to live a different life, a life that's based on God's principles, for want of a better phrase. Um, 
kindness and peace and justice and love. Mm. And he's inviting them to consider the possibility of them entering into this life. Um, and it's not necessarily about necessarily just about life after death, it's life, life here. So that's that, I, I don't know, even as I talk about it, that is a powerful vision. If, that, if that's exactly what he was talking about, and I think he was from an earlier part of the gospel, he was indicating that he was himself the, the way into this particular mm. kind of life. If that's what he was talking about, I can see that being a, an attractive proposition. Mm. I mean, even for us today, if we think about it, if we could live in a world like that, wow. And if it mm. was actually possible, if there was someone who said, and we believed him, if you follow me, in other words, if you learn from me, become my student, you know, you could help bring this about. This could change the whole world. In how we yeah, live. and I think also you know, we're so saturated in Christian thinking. You know, whether or not you uh, are a regular churchgoer, whether you sort of read the Bible and so on, um, it, it's part of our world. Um, and uh, so I think we lose the novelty of it, actually, yeah. because we, uh, we're, it's just part of our birthright in that sense. Um, and when you... Put yourself in the context of you know the first century um you lose the radicalism of the message i think yeah. um and what jesus is saying about humility i mean that's not a message that's going to uh, appeal to many in the greek speaking world certainly because you know greek gods they blow things up <laughs> and they don't care <laughs> uh, and it's the randomness of life uh, and uh, um there was clearly, you know, those sort of old gods, as they were probably beginning to be seen by that stage, there was a lot, there's a real search, a yearning for something new at this time. And it's not just, you know, looking through uh, uh, the Gospels as they became, but, uh, you know, you can see it in cults of sort of Mithras and so on and Isis. There's obviously this search for some sort of new way forward. Um, and I think what Jesus brings to the table is that, uh, you know, this is a gospel for the poor, the less successful. Yes. Um, and those people, um, you know, by the lakeside, we're almost certainly not members of the elite. Yes. Um, you know, they're much more likely to be consorting with the Roman leaders, as the occupation forces, essentially. Uh, so if you try to imagine what it was like, for example, in, in sort of in France in sort of 1940 to 44, yeah. um, then, you know, the French elites were mixing with the Germans in different ways. Yeah. Relatively few of them were, were, were joining the resistance until right at the last minute. Um, uh, it was often the poor who were doing the resisting yeah. <laughs> and putting their lives on the line. And, um, you know, it was jolly difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think if one looks back in the first century um, into sort of you know, Palestine as it was, um, then Jesus is communicating with the people who probably weren't communicated with by and large, weren't seen as important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Uh, and if you want to make a very contemporary message, you know, we, there's Britain's been through such a period of change over the last five years, a lot of hostility amongst many towards the elites who govern them. Um, and there's a message there from, from, from the example of Jesus saying, well, actually, start talking to the ordinary Joe and take them seriously, yeah. listen to them, yeah. um, uh, listen to the auth authenticity of the word that they have. Yeah. Uh, and don't just assume that just because you're wealthy, well-educated, privileged, that you necessarily know, actually you may not. Yeah, I think that's right. And uh, I'm not well versed in this particular way of looking at Mark, but there are numbers of authors, um, Ched Myers comes to mind, who look at Mark from a political point of view, very much along those lines. Yeah. See how the poor and disenfranchised are, 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 um, are the ones who Jesus kind of attracts or is, is attractive to. Mm. Um, and um, and it, is, it is, a powerful, is a powerful message. I think the idea of the, those who are on the outside as opposed to those on the inside being the mm. ones who are being appealed to here is, is, is the core. Mm. I guess we have to think about the context a bit more, though. It's not just a matter of riches and poverty, power or influence, although those things are there. Um, mm. It's also about religious um, respectability. And I think perhaps this passage has a flavour of that. 
that mm. you're you're out or you're in depending on how, how holy you are and holiness depended on your ability according to the passage at least uh, of your ability to can you know connect with the law and to follow the mm. law to the yeah. in, in its, all its detail and if you weren't doing that and clearly several of the people jesus was mixing with clearly weren't doing that then you were out you were considered yeah, to yeah. be uh, you know not not respectable and not worth thinking about mm. jesus seems to be jesus seemed to think about them jesus seemed to include them mm. um, shockingly mm. <laughs> to those who were who considered that was inappropriate um I think it's very interesting because actually, if you look at the way that, um, say, a very orthodox Jew um, at that stage, I mean, to be a good Jew meant to follow the law, mm. uh, and um, obviously from things like the, you know, if you look at Qumran and the scene sort of, and some of the fragments that have survived from 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 the excavations there, extraordinary, uh, you know, what has survived. Um, you know, these are people for whom they you are know, creating almost the first monastic communities really um and uh, you know for them it was the this sort of rigorous devotion to every last sort of penneth of the law that's what makes you sort of somebody who is holy yeah. um and jesus is asking a different question he's saying not do you obey the rules but what's your intention exactly uh, well, and that sense of intentionality hard. is that's uh, that is new yeah that's it that's it Let's, let's move on because I think there's so much here to dis discuss. I think it'd be for, it worth clearing up Levi. <laughs> <laughs> Levi the tax. He gets his name gets changed so much in yeah, the book. Does, yeah. yeah. Who is he? Matthew? Is he Levi? Who is he? And then yeah. then you look at the list of disciples later on, and it doesn't say Levi, son of Alphaeus. It says James, son of Alphaeus. Mm. This is in the same gospel. So who's James? Is it the same guy? I think the answer is we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the fair assumption that, uh, uh, and again, you know, go back to the, the sense of, you know, this was probably written at some haste um, by somebody who is putting together fragments of memory yeah. uh, and trying to sort of capture it while he still can. Um, should we be surprised that there are some confusions? I don't think we should be. Uh, you know, it's probably his best effort to try and distill what he knows yeah. uh, from the conversations he's had. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if we find the occasional contradiction, I, I just don't think we should worry about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's keep going a little while longer. So it's, mm. it's interesting to me because I've heard these words so often, um, but I really don't know if I know what the answer to what they mean is, but it, I, I, I've assumed I do. It says, follow me. I don't. Well, I mean, is that actually, what do you think? Is it literal? Follow me, you know, get up off your seat and go with me. Clearly, clearly that's what Levi does. He does. Mm. Or is it something else? Well, I suppose it's really a sense of, <coughs> you know, here's a direction. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're confused. You are probably, you know, and Levi clearly must have known as a good Jew uh, that he wasn't doing what a good Jew should do. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I suspect he was being called to a camp, really, uh, saying, you know, basically, get up off your bottom and do something about it. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, that's, uh, interesting. that's interesting. So do you think that Jesus was looking at him and thinking, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not doing what is right? Or, mm. was, or was Jesus actually... I don't know. I, I've often thought the, it's more like Jesus looks at him and doesn't condemn him, actually. doesn't condemn him in the way the others would. Because the, oh, Pharisees, the Pharisees would have probably, given the context here, thought, no, he's disreputable, disreputable because he's a, he's a collaborator. He's definitely mm. a sinner because he's working with the Romans. Oh. Yeah. And he's, yeah. not only that, he's an extortionist. So he, he's, he's way beyond the pale. But Jesus is saying, no, come and be my student. And mm. that's like a rabbi saying that is that's yeah. just not on. So. Mm. No, I, I, I not disagree with that. I think, you know, I do see uh, and I, I'm sure Jesus was seen at this stage as a remarkably sort of eloquent 
and convincing rabbi. I'm sure that's how he would have been seen by those at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so somebody who is evidently on the wrong side of the Jewish wire, if you like, yeah. uh, is being so, so as you know, do something about it. You know, yeah. you know, this isn't right. Yeah. But what is also interesting is that he's prepared to do so saying, you know, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying, yeah. sort it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not judgmental in that sense. No. Um, uh, whereas I think perhaps a more orthodox Jew would have said, you know, because you're this, yeah. then you'll be on the pale. Uh, yeah. And I think Jesus is saying, no, you know, this is within your grasp. You can do something about it. Yeah. So that's really important what you're saying, because what I think you're indicating here is Matthew's life or Levi's life isn't hunky dory. It's not perfect. Jesus recognizes mm. it, but he doesn't condemn him. He does, nevertheless, yeah. there is a way for him to go. It's what you're saying. And I think that's really important for the whole passage, because as we now read, uh, Matthew is not the only one. There are others yeah. who join yeah. them and they're called tax collectors and sinners. Mm. And well, it's interesting because I, I tend to use the King James version as yeah. publicans and sinners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just love the idea that anybody running a pub is really, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> you know, you've had it really. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, the worst of the worst, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I can't see that poor publicans and probably lovely people. I've often thought yeah, it's a bit tough, really. It's a bit yeah. tough on the publicans. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Absolutely. And, and so these people aren't being said, it isn't, Jesus isn't saying to them, is he? Um, oh, no, no, come into my community. Uh, we're not even going to think about the fact that you're into prostitution or extortion. We're just going to let you do what you want. But it's all about love and being kind to each other. It's not that, is it? It's come into my community. But, you know, there is a, there is a thing, it's a job for you to do. To get yeah, your, it's rigorous. Get your life. It's demanding. You know? Uh, and, you know, you know you're in a sense, being called to, to change. Uh, and I think that's the critical thing here. So I don't think necessarily means just literally sort of pick up your backpack and wander around sort of wherever Jesus might be. Yeah. Uh, it's saying, take charge of your life. I mean, I suppose if we were to use modern jargon, we'd say this is about empowerment, really. Yeah. It's quite saying, uh, whatever you've done in the past, you can be different in the future. Yeah. I guess, though, it's... For them, it meant an opportunity. They may have probably wanted to change in a way, but their, mm. their opportunities for doing that were quite limited. If they were being cast into this, this place of, you know, uh, where they were untouchable by the Pharisees, if that's what they were, you know, if they were seen as people who were beyond the pale, then they had no mm. Mm. So if they were going to change, if there was light at the end of the tunnel, and they knew that they needed to change. Jesus offered them that hope, didn't he? He offered them that opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I, I've thought about this. And again, I think this is where, where it gets very difficult because I think the, the problem is that we use the term Pharisee as if it's some sort of organised block. Yeah. I, I'm sure that wasn't true. Uh, uh, and they're used as a sort of metaphor for um, a rather severe Orthodox Jews who, um, and the Sadducees would be another lot. Uh, and I, I just don't think that, probably works really uh, what you really got is saying there's a sort of very rigid unthinking unforgiving orthodoxy and Jesus is challenging that yes. uh, and saying uh, we're not going to condemn um, or judge uh, but we are going to ask you to change yes that's I think that's for me that's the message that you know uh, whatever you've done in the past um, uh, you can shift and yes. you know and and I guess that's that that message of forgiveness it's so powerful yeah absolutely. because you're saying you know you, you might have done some pretty well and we've all done things that we look back particularly if you think back to when we were sort of in our teenage years I mean goodness knows uh, yeah. if we haven't got things that we're probably ashamed of then we probably weren't <laughs> we weren't being normal and yeah. uh, you know, yeah. as you go through life there are things that you just you just get wrong yeah. um and Often you do you, you do so for the best of reasons, but you just make mistakes. Uh, and I think that's what Jesus is saying here. You know, just because you've made mistakes, that does not condemn you forever. Yeah. Um, but it does call upon you to recognise that yeah. and to change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's followed not just in that process, that process of forgiveness and change, mm. but follow me suggests I think there's a lifestyle now for you, a, a way mm. of living. Yeah. In my in my kind of it kind of in my steps walking in my steps the way I do it look at it and consider it and and not only that is a sense of being 
in relationship with this person. It's not simply listen to this guy's teaching, although that's absolutely relevant. It's about the me, the person himself. So it's, a, you know, you know, as well as I do, as teachers, mm. we, would, we would communicate through our words, and obviously we would, and what we said and what we put on a PowerPoint or whatever, mm. but it would, be, it would be who we are as much as anything else mm. that would communicate. So the very best teachers, I, I, I think you'd agree, were the ones who were, there was a, an integrity, there was an authenticity, there was mm. a, a, a compassion, yeah. Um, a love for the students mm. and the students knew that um, mm. and I think that's what that's that all of that for me is wrapped up in this individual Jesus that mm. he's he's more than just a teacher he's mm. a person who invites a relationship as well um, mm. yeah I mean I've thought about this a lot of, over the years about you know what what makes for effective teaching and I've come to the conclusion that actually less and less can it be sort of easily calibrated and put into a neat box um, because it's so much about the quality of the relationships that you have. Yeah. And we will all know that sometimes we have um, sort of connected with a particular people and you only find out sometimes years later uh, that you said something or did something and that made a difference to that particular child. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we can probably remember instances ourselves of a particular lesson or a, some sort of, you know, could be a, it doesn't have to be in a classroom, but, um, but something where somebody in authority as a teacher connected to you. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is something which, um, that's why you've got to be so careful because you're always on view and, at some juncture, you might say something a little too casually, too harshly, um, perhaps, you know, with an element of sarcasm or something, and you, you might do some real damage and you're not even aware of it. Exactly. Equally, just the smallest act of compassion yeah. um, can make an enormous difference to a vulnerable 11, 12, 13 year old. It can be life changing. You're right, absolutely yeah. right. So anyway, Jesus seems to collect these guys. Um, mm. He has dinner with them, which I think is crucial from a point of view of first century Judaism. Yeah. Having yeah. dinner with someone's like saying, you know, you are part of my family. I'm accepting mm. you. Um, <laughs> but he's having dinner with people who are notoriously, you know, criminals, as it were, to the religious establishment. Mm. So that's an interesting thing. I I'll tell you what I think about that, because um, it's a it's a. It's a question, you know, that we could ask, why, why have dinner? <laughs> why, mm. why sit down and have dinner? Apart from the sense of inclusiveness, inclusivity, which we've talked about, I, I, I wonder whether there's something going on, which is kind of related to what you were talking about earlier, the, the end of the world. Mm. Um, is there a symbol? Is there something symbolic in having dinner? Is this, is this something about how God sees us as part of his family um including all people whatever they've done the offer is there to enjoy a dinner enjoy his company mm -hmm. enjoy forgiveness enjoy uh this sense of community as well i think dinner yeah. for me is an empower very powerful message yeah i mean i think you know again sort of Look at the Jewish context as well, and uh, um, you know, I, 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 you know, when I was I went to university, it was the first time I really met Jews in significant numbers. And um, a guy who actually became my best man uh, was a, a North London Jew, and uh, and it was a revelation to me actually how they thought. And one of the things that was most powerful was uh, you know the, on Friday evening, the night before the Sabbath, getting together and sharing a meal yeah. in a very particular way, and uh, that understanding of fee or you know eating together uh in a family context yeah. uh is still very powerful in the jewish sort of faith and so uh, that sense of eating together there's a lot of trust in that too if you think about it because um think about the jewish dietary uh, laws you know it's or in deuteronomy and so on um about what you should do what you shouldn't do you know leviticus is full of this stuff as well um and then you know, all of that stuff would be humming around the heads of jews at that time um and there's a trust that you're not going to be fed something which you shouldn't eat yeah um so 
Jesus is inviting people to, to dine with him, uh, that's a relationship of welcome, yeah. hospitality, yeah. and trust. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's saying that to people who most Orthodox Jews would think long and hard before inviting to the table. Absolutely. And um, what Jesus is doing, saying, I don't care about what you've yes. done in the past. Yeah. Come break bread with me. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Mm. And I think as a, as a Christian myself, I think, that's a message that we all need to hear. It's still there. Mm. I happen to believe this Jesus figure is still around. He's still alive. And, mm. you know, that invitation is there still. Um, whether the church always communicates that well, that's another matter. Um, but nevertheless, yeah. that, that, that simple invitation mm. to enjoy fellowship um, is there, definitely. Yeah, just sort of share one's common humanity. Yeah. And, um, you know, not judge somebody because of the way they speak or because um, they perhaps paddle across the channel in an inflatable boat and, uh, you know, come from vulnerable communities. Um, we need to be a lot more sort of forgiving, I think, of people and also recognise that uh, you know, we're very privileged living as we do in the Western world. Uh, a lot of people have real struggles and uh, I mean, that... To me personally, that really hits home because I worked in Peru for a year uh, just after leaving university. And I will never forget it, just arriving in Lima, really knowing nothing at all. Uh, and I spent uh, my first evening there with a lady who worked as a nutritionist um, um, in some of the poorest communities uh, that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and she took me out the next day and we went out to uh, people living in the middle of a large rubbish dump. Uh, a smell was indescribable, but there were people who burrowed out homes in the rubbish uh, and were living, making a living really, out of filtering through, finding stuff they could recycle. It was the most sort of basic life you could consider, really. Um, and she was approaching it because these were people who needed help uh, and they were rejected by society around because they were seen as thieves you know people who were uh, right on the margins of society and yeah you know, if you're asking where jesus would be today he'd be there yes exactly, exactly. um and uh, so it, you know where would jesus be now in our society well he'd probably be paddling across the channel in a boat that seemed to be taking on water that's really, um, really important and, he's, and, and then you could therefore argue based on that jesus is calling us if we we're going to listen to him if we're going to be a disciple of jesus his call mm. to do likewise yeah. and <laughs> to be there to forgive to invite to fellowship to mm. help to, br to mm. help break bread mm. to, to help those in need to heal and so forth yeah absolutely right uh, and i think not be too judgmental yeah uh, it's uh, it's so easy just to condemn people because they're different from you uh, and we're tribal creatures. Yeah. I think it's said that you know that we can have about 150 people we know well. Presuming that's around about the size of a sort of hunter-gatherer pack yeah. when we sort of evolved to this. So um, you know, we're, we're those tribal feelings are so easy to evoke, uh, and the sort of casual racism that is still part and parcel of you know modern British society. Um, you know, that is exactly what's being said here. Don't do that. Exactly. Don't judge people because fundamentally just because you don't know them, yeah. um, because they're different. Uh, don't reject them because they have a different accent, different color of skin, because they seem to uh, have different dietary habits or whatever. Um, Jesus is saying something quite different. And it's very radical. You know, at that time, this must have been like a bolt from the blue. Yeah, totally. um, yeah. He's saying, don't do that. You know, um, OK, you, you've been brought up with this very rigid attitude towards what constitutes good behaviour. Yeah. And he's saying, be flexible, be welcoming exactly. um, and uh, take people on their own terms if you can and uh, try and understand them, really. Yeah. And I think that's sort of a, you know, a gospel of understanding. How about that as a phrase? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, we talked a little bit about the law as well. And I think for me, it sounds a bit cliche, but I think it's true still that Jesus was really... He wasn't not obeying the law. He was, he, as you said earlier, he was fulfilling the law. But it was like yeah. they got the, the kind of the emphasis on the kind of the letter of it so tightly yeah. distorted. They'd forgotten the spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, um, yeah, I mean, if you look through the preceding 500 years, you can see more and more accretions uh, in Judaic law um, 
which obviously you can see in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. as we call it, not that the Jews would ever see it in those times, but um, uh, but seeing in the world, you know, accumulating sort of regulation. Mm-hmm. And you can see that in the modern world, you know, you know, it's impossible for a human being to know what the law is, but you're still accountable for it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the sheer complexity of regulation means it's bewildering. Yeah. And for many, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews who wanted to be good Jews uh, in first century sort of Rome or well, first century Galilee, Jolly hard to know yes. uh, as yeah. to how to proceed on that, that basis. And Jesus is saying, actually, it's simpler than you think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, going back to that fundamental tenet, do unto others as you would do, you know, or that you'd have them do for yourself. And, you know, just, you know, that sense of looking at people in their common humanity and accepting them as they are. Yeah. And that's a terribly powerful message. And it's not that, you know, it's not totally unique to the Judeo-Christian tradition. You can see it, I believe, in Confucian sort of thinking. You can see it in Buddhism as well. But um, but it's a very powerful message in the first century Galilee. Yeah, powerful, definitely. We do have to tackle one more question, as it were, which is the last mm-hmm. verse. You know, he's getting these Pharisees, whoever they are, getting upset with him about eating with these notorious flakes um criminals some of them mm. um and he's saying it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick i've not come to call the righteous but sinners now what we can say i guess with any with, with some conviction is he's using a metaphor there he's saying i'm a yeah. kind of physician okay but the question i think is so what, who are the sick and who are the, who are the sinners and who are the righteous? And what does it mean when he talks about them? I think for me, the idea that the people who he's having to dinner are the sinners, that makes sense. But who are the righteous? Is he, is he having a subtle dig at the, the Pharisees here? He's saying, you see yourself as righteous, but you're not really. Mm. I've heard people teach that. I'm personally not convinced. I, I think it's just him making the metaphor clear to me that, mm. you know, the point of me being here isn't, isn't to sort out healthy people. I'm a physician. A physician helps people who are ill. That's mm. my role. And so, you know, why are you complaining about me eating with sinners? That's exactly what mm. I'm supposed to do. He's not necessarily having a dig at them for feeling that they are superior. Um, Mm. And I guess, just like as you said earlier, we're all in this position. That's how I see it anyway. We've all done things which we're we're ashamed of and we're feeling, you know, oh, we wish wish I hadn't done that. It's part Mm. of normal life, you know, as you you said, teenagers and and so on. And I, I guess that's how Jesus looks at it, I would imagine, that we're all in this place of not getting it right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <Often. laughs> That's a very interesting thought about a physician, because I've often wondered, you know, what, what does a physician mean here? So, I mean, it's written in Greek. I, I would be interested to know, and I don't know the answer to this, you know, what level of access to a physician would uh, an ordinary Jew in somewhere like Galilee or Nazareth mm. have had? Yeah. My guess is probably they wouldn't, no. because it would be a transaction, it would be expensive yeah. but this was probably written in Rome it's in Greek so it's the time of somebody like Galen yeah. um, so this is somebody who probably is writing a more sophisticated level the mere fact that they can write in Greek means they're sophisticated um, and so they are looking at it some as somebody who has knowledge the, the uh, healing power somebody of some significance it's clearly a metaphor yeah. um, uh, but it's interesting I mean I'm, I'm come from a very medical background. My dad was a doctor, brother's one, daughter's one, and my uncle was one, you know. Uh, I was brought up in that sort of medical context. And I remember talking a lot to my father about uh, what it was, you know, what it was like to, to have all this knowledge about how to, to help people. And he was actually very clear, so often you couldn't. Wow. Uh, and one of the things he found most challenging was to face somebody and say, I've done all I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's a really tough message. And when he was dying, he'd had to have the same message dealt to him yeah. by a doctor who'd gone through everything. So I, I've done all I can. I remember my father saying that was a really tough thing to hear, mm-hmm. even though 
he was a doctor. He started and run intensive care in, in the county. So he'd seen people at their most sickest and had been through any number of, you know, thousands upon thousands of patient stories. Um, but to hear it personally was really tough. So when Jesus is talking here about being a physician, it's a very specific thing he's saying. Uh, and he's saying, I have a sort of message, a sort of knowledge, if you like. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sharing that with the, the most vulnerable. Uh, and so his focus is clearly, you know, not those who kind of, you know, you know, taking it literally, who probably are righteous. You know, they sort of don't need me so much. Yeah. The people that need me are those who've really got problems. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. don't, don't focus on the saints, focus on the sinners. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Mm, that's that is food for thought. Julian, um, the whole podcast has been food for thought. Uh, I'm really, really grateful for you coming on the show. And we have been, I have been excellently entertained. I should have explained at the beginning, I don't know if you did really, um, that you are a historian. So you, you mm. know what you're talking about. And um, it's brilliant that we've had someone of, of such learnedness on the show. Thank you so much. Well, I would immediately say this is not my period. So. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I didn't come across. But, uh, it's been fascinating yeah. to just talk it through with you. And actually, I've been thinking on my feet talking to you, actually, because uh, it's uh, it's endlessly interesting. And uh, the more you try to understand it, it still comes across as it's an absolutely remarkable story. And uh, we should always try and recapture that sense of novelty, the radicalism of it, the challenge to exist existing ideas and I think that remains its most powerful message really uh, that uh, you're being challenged to look at your life anew all the time uh, and uh, that is something we should always think about yeah I couldn't agree more thank you ever so much so for those who are listening or watching thank you for being with us and I hope you'll come and join us next time uh, with the next installment of question mark the podcast and do subscribe, as I say, and follow and tell your friends as well. And if you have any comments or questions, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Thank you again and uh, goodbye. It's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of Question Mark and don't want to miss any future episodes, make sure to click on the subscribe button. This also means other people can find the podcast and join the conversation. We'd also love if you could leave a review so we know what was good and what we can improve for future episodes. Join us and our special guest next time where we'll continue to explore the greatest story ever told together. If you want to get involved with the podcast or have any questions or comments in the meantime, please do get in touch using the I Am Mark social media channels. We'd love to hear from you. We'll light it up, we won't come down And the sun can't stop us now Watching it come true, it's taking over you This is the greatest show Where it's covered in all the colored lights And the runaways are running the night Impossible comes true, it's taking over you This is the greatest show